Hi, this video is part three of my attempt to answer the question, what is a country? In this one, we're talking about borders and migration. I want to show not only that immigration is not a problem, but that if you really believe in freedom like everyone says they do, letting people move to a new place should be a no-brainer. I'm Chris, and welcome back to the show for the discerning Doom Scroller. Since World War II, perhaps the most popular bigotry has been opposition to immigration. The right wing and the corporate media have made the idea of restricting immigration to a trickle with billion dollar forces decked out in military gear normal. As if it were self-evident such forces reduced the presence of drugs, gangs, and violence. Yet, due to the repeated tightening of borders to migration, violence against migrants keeps escalating. But in politics and the media, violence against migrants is not considered a problem. The migrants are considered the problem. Why? Let's ask Harsha Walia. And when I read from a book today, it'll be this one. To begin with, for immigration to be a problem, people must live in a propertied relationship to land. That is, land is a commodity that can be owned and controlled by one group of people. I've pointed out before that since you have no control over it, you don't own the country or the government or probably any property. And I've been asking how the ruling class came to control all the land, property, and wealth. Who was the land stolen from? Who created all the wealth it was used for? Who stole that? Why do we still accept their ownership as legitimate? Why do we give their property, like the countries they own, our respect and loyalty? Because someone in authority told us our country is really our property, which we might believe all our lives, even though you know we control nothing in practice. Why do we let them divide us against people all around the world in the same boat as us? Because over the years we've been subtly taught, but imagine we figured out for ourselves, the apparent fact that people from other places are going to ruin our property if we let them cross its borders. People who own nothing tell other people who own nothing the latter are not allowed into the space the former don't own. States want you to believe they're just holding the land in trust for you, the real owners of it, and in the name of preserving the land and protecting you from all the dangerous things, it puts up borders. Historically, borders are where an expanding kingdom, state, or empire was forced to stop expanding. When rulers conquer people, they force them to settle down because it's easier to enslave sedentary people than people who move around. It seemed natural to use those borders to stop people's movement, however many cultures they destroy. I took a few classes on nations and nationalism, and I often read that citizenship confers certain rights, on the assumption that protecting your rights is one of the state's main reasons for existing. Rights, by the way, are a few things the state promises to try real hard not to do to you, unless they really want to. There is some merit to the claim about citizenship granting rights, because if you're a citizen, you have the right, on paper, which is where all rights exist, to reside within the borders of the state you belong to. But by creating this right, the state takes away anyone else's right to reside there. Now you're only allowed to live anywhere in the world, regardless of what you're doing, if you have express permission from the state. The same people who complain about politicians and bureaucracy suddenly trust them to pry into everyone's lives, grab their data, and then sort the good people from the bad people. It's understandable for people who own things to be protective of them, so when you're told your whole life you own this landmass, you figure you want to keep it safe. 
But when you're told you have a country, you know, from birth, you also begin to see the rest of the world through the stereotypes you get from your so-called country. And you learn that keeping a country safe means keeping out most of the people in the world. You learn that people from other countries, or skin colors, That train's never late! are different, inferior, untrustworthy, and if the news says so, the enemy. Which leads to bigotry and violence against the people you're supposed to defend your country from. Rulers always benefit from ideologies that divide us, the, you know, the rest of us, so we never realize we could unite to have it all. We're divided against each other in favor of our rulers, because we don't even know we're being ruled. I once heard someone say, we can't get rid of borders because, quote, I like sovereignty. Poor guy thinks he has sovereignty. You don't. You're not sovereign and never have been. You don't make the laws. The sovereign is the state. That's what all the guys with guns are for, imposing the sovereign's will on you. To all intents and purposes, your country is your ruler, and the state owns it. And immigrants are just people who want to move. But the propaganda is strong. After a lifetime of being told to identify with the state in opposition to everyone else, we come to see immigration as a potential threat to... You know, whatever. By invoking the state itself as a victim, migrants are cast as illegals and criminals who are committing an act of assault on the state. Migrants become prisoners of passage, their unauthorized migration is considered a trespass, and their very existence is criminalized. In a telling representation, one of the principal detention centers in Canada is the Canadian Immigration Prevention Center at Laval. Migrants are not seen for their actual humanity, but instead as a problem to be prevented, deterred, managed, and contained. They become stereotyped by politicians, media, and within popular consciousness as floods of people from over there who are disease-ridden, fraudulent, or security threats. These narratives buttress moral panics about keeping borders safe and secure from poor and racialized migrants. But why did we buy into them? Do you really have more interests in common with the people with all the money who own your country, or with regular people from other places trying to make a better life for themselves? As the main weapons in the state's arsenal are violence and propaganda, every situation requires an escalation of one or both. The borders of places like the US and EU are such situations. The violence keeps escalating and the nationalists keep encouraging it because any amount of cruelty is fine in the name of keeping my country safe. Don't think of borders just existing the way they look on maps, just at the edge of the country, because they're enforced everywhere, especially at international ports like airports. As Etienne Balibar says, borders are no longer at the border. States are always trying to expand their power because, among other reasons that we'll get into, the more power it has over more aspects of life, the more the state can make money for its business-owning friends. That motivation has guided state action for hundreds of years now, including the expansion and even abolition of slavery. In an age where it's technically illegal to conquer other states and occupy their territory, the state comes up with different pretexts, like border enforcement, to take power over people. The EU enforces its borders all over North Africa. As a result, more than 52,000 refugees have died and 10,000 more disappeared in the past 30 years due to Fortress Europe policies. In the US, ICE, or Immigration and Customs Enforcement, so ICE, claims jurisdiction within a hundred miles of the border. ICE agents can stop you in this zone where most Americans live for no reason other than to check your papers. Modern Americans who talk about but don't study Nazi Germany probably haven't even noticed the similarity. Because, to them, ICE are the good paper checkers who only get rid of the bad people. Because like all instruments of propaganda, borders exist in our minds. 
One of the biggest lies that keeps the border in place is it keeps the people inside it safe from the bad people on the other side. You would have to believe that for, for some reason nobody seems to be able to explain, people are somehow worse on the other side of the line. That the drug dealers, human traffickers, murderers, and child predators are all on the other side of the line, not inside. Because it's not power that tempts and incentivizes people to do terrible things, but where they're from. The people you're listening to, believing, trusting to make policies and sort the good from the bad, they're doing the things you claim to want to keep out. Isn't stopping them, people with power, more important than stopping people just trying to make a new life? Because if not, the effects of your beliefs wouldn't be to stop drug traffickers, human traffickers, killers, predators, but to empower them. Making it harder to cross from Mexico into the U.S. due to the militarization of the border has killed some 5,600 people, and two-thirds of women have experienced sexual abuse, all of it enabled by the rhetoric of the dangerous immigrant. The nation-state requires outsiders, people not worthy of inclusion in the imagined community. So we're not supposed to care about them. I don't care if anyone came here legally or illegally, and as I explain here, I don't believe you care either. I don't say things like, most of them are good, hard-working, law-abiding people when talking about immigrants, partly because I don't care whether they are or not, because I don't own businesses and hire employees, so it makes no difference to me, and partly because it legitimizes the right-wing arguments it's responding to. Because if anyone can be considered not all of those things, they're no longer worthy of freedom. We're still assuming we should be allowing people to come, selecting the hard workers or whatever else we claim to value, and rewarding them with being allowed to occupy space near us, like the benign white country that we are. What, lazy people shouldn't be allowed to move? Everyone's lazy sometimes. So what? Kick everyone out unless they're working 60-hour weeks? Or you're going to claim people who don't follow every law shouldn't be allowed to move? Everyone breaks the law. You, me, everyone who believes in it, everyone who makes it and enforces it, everyone capable of breaking it breaks the law. Using hard-working or law-abiding as excuses to limit immigration is pure hypocrisy. The difference on immigration between liberals and conservatives seems to be conservatives want people to stay over there, but still work for us in the global supply chain, whereas liberals don't mind if they come here and do it. I want to be on an equal footing with everyone else, not reinforce this system of inequality. I want people to be safe and free, not allow them safety and freedom subject to their desirability as workers. Some people think immigrants and refugees should be grateful, and to me that's just more unquestioned nationalism. Let us consider even the term immigrant. This term presumes people must naturally be bound to one place, and if they travel then they're where they don't belong. If you stay, you're expected to be grateful and kiss people's asses and talk about how great the country is and change all your customs because you're not allowed to be different. If you wanted to be different, you should move somewhere else. You're only allowed to be one way in any geographic location. But people move because they want a better life, and we deny it them because of whatever the last reason I heard was. Migrants don't have anything to be grateful to you for. Most people who want the power to limit immigration didn't do anything to earn that power except squat this land and gatekeep what color of person gets to come in. For anything specific, you can be grateful to the person who made it or bought it for you, but I don't see the virtue in allowing people to come in when there's no reason they should be kept out in the first place. 
and when it means denying entry to the other 99% who applied. I'm sure we've heard all the most common excuses for borders at this point. All the major claims, like immigrants disproportionately bringing drugs and crime and disease, have been debunked all over the internet, which is important, but it doesn't work on the people railing against immigration because they've already made their minds up. And I think it's just as important to point out these arguments are often in bad faith and to expose the motivations of the people making them. But even when they're spoken with conviction, arguments for borders usually beg the question. They don't cross the logical gap between something I don't like is coming into this part of the world and spending billions of dollars patrolling this line with guns is the correct way to deal with it. They're always talking about drugs and gangs, for example, when if you really want to stop the deaths and violence associated with drugs, you legalize them. Criminalizing supplying something for which there's still a huge demand just pushes it underground, which I thought was the argument against criminalizing the ownership of firearms. Do people look at the trillion dollars spent and million people dead prosecuting the war on drugs and think it's all been worth it to make no progress whatsoever? Don't introduce violence into a situation. That's what creates gangs. That's where they get their money. Some estimates find that about two-thirds of the revenue of organized crime around the world comes from the drug trade. Where drugs are legal, people just buy them safely. So there's no need for violence and therefore no revenue for organized crime. Seems like a slam dunk, if that's what you actually care about. But even if borders could somehow put a dent in the drug trade, a more basic question remains. Why do you, or the state, have the right to tell people they don't have the right to enter this part of the world? If you say, because it's your home, well, it isn't, because your home is 40 square meters of bed, shower, and TV. The only reason anyone has the right to enforce state borders is because might makes right because conquerors create and protect their property with states. The inheritors of the state, usually whoever has the most money, have an interest in dividing workers so we don't realize who the real enemies are. So they whip up fear of cultural and economic change, drugs, crime, and now even demographic change. Oh no, fewer white people. It's just excuses for racism, the kind the global border regime is built on. I'm not necessarily calling anyone a racist. We all grew up under a system that subtly inculcates us in racist assumptions and stereotypes. For four or five hundred years now, white supremacy has been a very powerful force in the world, and its influence can be felt in everything from our attitudes towards immigrants to the food we eat. So it's not just white people affected by it, it's everyone. I used to ask my friends in Egypt, if you care as much as you say about the Palestinian cause, why not let them move to Egypt if they want? And they would go, whoa, whoa, hang on there. As if they would somehow lose something, and that something was worth more than people's lives. But again, that's the system we live under. That's what it does gives us reasons why being racist isn't actually racist, and why supporting people's continued oppression is actually good. If you have a bottomless reserve of excuses against letting people in, how, however many times someone debunks them, your reasons are your feelings, and your feelings are racist. If, however, you don't want to be racist, good news, you can change. You can learn to understand your beliefs, impressions, and reactions to things, especially borders and other forms of policing. You can also ask why people would want you to be racist. Who would benefit from that? You could look at how much money is spent on policing borders and who gets that money. Like everything else under capitalism, the border is a major source of cash for big corporations, which lobby for more enforcement, more surveillance equipment, and more prisons. 
According to Detention Watch Network, five prison corporations that hold contracts with the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement have poured $20 million into lobbying efforts. Arizona's controversial SB 1070, which legalizes racial profiling based on suspicion of being an illegal immigrant, was drafted during a meeting between state legislatures and the Corrections Corporation of America, the largest private prison corporation in the United States. Right-wing politicians use a tough-on-immigration message to gain power. If immigrants are painted as inherently suspicious and threatening, cracking down on them must be the right thing to do to keep the good people safe. Rounding up and indefinitely incarcerating people for illegally crossing invisible lines creates photo opportunities for all kinds of assholes. And saying the borders are open while staring at proof to the contrary justifies escalating the violence indefinitely. And if we're talking about who benefits, we can't forget corporations that hire undocumented laborers at illegally low wages. The abuse the poorest migrants go through is a result of a process of turning the illegal migrant into the illegal foreign worker. Practices of arrest without charge, expulsion, indefinite detention, torture, and killings have become the unexceptional norm in militarized border zones. The racist, classist, heteropatriarchal, and ableist construction of the legal desirable migrant justifies the criminalization of the illegal undesirable migrant, which then emboldens the conditions for capital to further exploit the labor of migrants. Migrants' precarious legal status and precarious stratification in the labor force are further inscribed by racializing discourses that cast migrants of color as eternal outsiders in the nation-state, but not of the nation-state. In other words, foreign brown people are not really allowed in our club. We'll take their resources, but there will be paltry compensation. If you're opposed to immigration and claim your intentions are not racist, you're presumably equally opposed to locals giving birth. The same logic applies to children, after all, except the arguments are valid this time. The government never approved of this new addition to the population, and neither did I. They use up resources, but they don't contribute any. They commit acts of violence and theft, but they're protected, so you can't charge them. So why is anti-immigration so common and anti-natalism so rare? Is it racism? Is it the assumption that most kids being born are white and people coming in are not white? Anti-immigration is today's acceptable racism. It's racism designed for respectability politics, to provide plausible deniability to anyone accused of racism just because they don't want any brown people near them. If your arguments have official backing, you can keep believing you abhor racism while advocating tighter borders. Again, everyone commits crime, but of course, crime committed by immigrants gets more attention than the average crime, just like crimes committed by black people and homeless people, because media create and feed stereotypes. A lot of the trouble migrants get into is due to a failure to integrate, which goes both ways. Sure, people should try to respect the culture they're moving to, but also give them a chance to by letting them meet people and learn the language, giving them somewhere to live and a chance to make money, or even better, the freedom to engage in mutual aid. But a lot of places do provide some measure of those things, and there's still racism against migrants because no amount of integration will ever be enough for people who demand strict conformity and people who whip up fear of immigrants for their own power. Immigrants commit crime, they say as if a member or several members of whichever right-wing party they belong to hadn't just been arrested for trying to solicit sex from minors. Not all migrants get that much. They might get offered zero job opportunities but still be expected to make money, so they steal. They might get treated like shit by locals so they form gangs. They might form gangs anyway if drugs are illegal because they want to make money just like local dealers. Events have causes, and it's rarely people from there are bad. Either way, as vulnerable people, migrants will never have the power to commit as much violence as the state does by closing borders. 
Obviously, border closers don't care, but if you do, you might want to ask why people move in the first place. Most people don't like leaving their homes for good. Many are forced to flee to escape violence or poverty. The knee-jerk reaction to this point is, it's not my fault they had to leave, but that's irrelevant. You're not being punished by having people who speak a different language somewhere near you. I don't even see how it could inconvenience you. If you're really so closed-minded you don't even want to talk to the people, you don't have to. You know, freedom of association as opposed to power to stop people from associating. But even though it's unnecessary to assign personal blame, if you insist on doing so, are you sure it's not your fault in any way? Why are these people desperate to move? If they're from Central America, for example, as many immigrants to the U.S. are, it's quite possible their homes were destroyed and their lives threatened by a state that the U.S. put in place and propped up for decades, or a civil war stirred up by the U.S., or drug traffickers feeding the U.S. market. Border controls are most severely deployed by those Western regimes that create mass displacement and are most severely deployed against those whose very recourse to migration results from the ravages of capital and military occupations. So these people's leaving their homes is less their own fault than that of, say, someone who pays taxes in the U.S., buys bananas from Chiquita, and supports highly authoritarian regimes because they think that's stability. The no-fault white innocence thing goes back a long way, and now it's a big part of strong border rhetoric. Having talked to so many white Americans and Canadians who insist nothing is their fault, I find if you talk about history enough, they'll also say their ancestors were heroes who fought in, you know, whatever good war, but never participated in the bad wars or genocide or slavery or Jim Crow, because, you know, they want to have it both ways. Some people might have done bad things, but not my people. Likewise, I believe in freedom, just not for strangers. These are people who watch the TV and shake their heads at what's happening to those people in that country. But if you suggest they be allowed to move here, well, that's going too far. Sure, we could save millions from war and famine, but not if it means they might live somewhere near me. I'd rather have the police state. Despite what to me are clear reasons to support the complete elimination of borders, there's no reason to expect the state will ever willingly give up this power. The state extends its power as far as it can in as many ways as it can. It's the same reason most places would never eliminate crime. The state benefits from the power to criminalize. Considering the border an issue of security is, among other things, a pretext to send agents and sometimes vigilantes to extend the state's rule over even its most desolate hinterland, always making new things its problem. Power is not given up willingly by the person holding it, but destroyed by the person subject to it. From mayday marches of millions of undocumented migrants in the United States and riots of immigrant use in France to weekly detention center protests in Australia and daily mobilizations against the Israeli apartheid wall, localized resistances are manifestations of a global phenomenon affirming the freedom to stay, move, and return in the face of border imperialism. Indigenous Sehwepem artist Tanya Willard observes, Fences and borders can't stop the flow of rivers, migration of butterflies, or the movement of people, and won't stop the spirit of freedom. The simple fact is, you have way more in common with most people in every country than you do with your rulers in this country. People all around the world are scratching to get by, angry that their freedom and livelihoods are getting taken away, angry at the violence, the lack of accountability, the precarity of life. Your rulers don't have any of those problems. The so-called justice system works for them. They can go wherever they want, do what they want, build ho huge homes anywhere they want, and take helicopters everywhere. They're the ones who took all your money. They're the ones who control state institutions like the police. They're the ones who own the companies you work for and the media who tell you how to think. Why would any cultural differences with people in other parts of the world matter more than class differences? 
Moreover, in the age of climate change, i.e. the rest of our lives, everyone could become a refugee. Because however secure you think your home and your town are, nature is stronger. You might get treated the way you treated refugees on your shores. Or you might get lucky and get relocated somewhere the people are kind and compassionate regardless of where you're from. And you realize how you were lied to all this time. Human history is the story of human movement. It's only in the past century we've criminalized it, when dark-skinned people started migrating in large numbers to places white people had settled. Property owners have kept fear of illegal immigrants and brown people alive, and the right wing has gleefully transmitted their messages for them. I say, expose the excuses for what they are, expose the violence and the bigotry, and end global border apartheid.